my name is Jason Vanstone. Um, I'm the research scientist uh, for stewardship and clinical appropriateness, working with our antimicrobial stewardship program and others here in Regina. Um, so today I'm going to give an overview of a paper that our research group uh, recently published. So we're going to be talking about this study called ICU, or on antibiotics, um, which was a fun little play on ICU that no one really got, but we went with it anyways. Um, so it's all about uh, empiric therapy and adherence to guidelines for pneumonia, specifically in the ICU. So um, I'll, a couple shout-outs here for the people involved in this. So Shelby Flansner, um, who uh, is, was, is currently finishing her residency uh, in Saskatoon. Um, so any of you that are joining us from there might know Shelby and, and some of the people from here in Regina may have run into her while she was uh, working uh, during her BSP. Um, Casey Phillips, uh, so Casey is the lead pharmacist for our antimicrobial stewardship program here in Regina. Um, and this whole thing was Jonathan Millman's baby. So Dr. Millman came to us uh, in, I guess it was like the winter of 2017 when this all sort of started, um, with an idea to look into, to, to uh, collaborate with the antimicrobial stewardship program, um, to look into the appropriateness of empiric therapy uh, for pneumonia in the ICU. Um, and we were more than happy to work with him and Shelby on this. And so the collaboration kind of grew out of that and we have successfully published that study. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, I personally am not a clinician. So if there are any questions at the end that are more clinically oriented, um, Casey and Jonathan are both here today. Um, so they can always help to chime in if you have things that I am not able to answer. Okay. So with that, um, the one thing that I thought was really interesting about this study when Jonathan first uh, sort of brought it up to us is uh, this idea that there is uh, this notion that sometimes uh, antimicrobial stewardship initiatives <laughs> seem like they can be at odds with uh, care for patients in the ICU um, in that, you know, we've got really sick patients in the ICU and so uh, we have to give them everything that we can all the time as much as possible to try and make them better. Um, and so what I thought was really interesting about this is this idea that they're not necessarily at odds. In fact, AMS and ICU and the ICU can work together um, towards better outcomes for those patients. And so just to exemplify some of that, uh, a couple of studies listed at the bottom there, just to talk about in general, when AMS is implemented in ICUs, uh, number one, we see no change in mortality. So we aren't increasing uh, death in patients in the ICU based on doing a better job of, uh, of uh, antibiotic usage. This also, when we do uh, AMS in the ICU, it decreases antimicrobial usage. So whether you're looking at days of therapy or DVDs or number of prescriptions, however you want to measure that. Um, and then of course, associated with that is a decrease in costs. Um, that's not what we're going for when we're doing antimicrobial stewardship. We're not just trying to reduce the cost of drugs, um, but that just happens to be a happy side effect of using antibiotics more appropriately, uh, most often as a reduction in cost. Um, and of course, it does help to decrease broad spectrum therapy when you can get people onto narrow uh, spectrum drugs sooner um, that, uh, that will allow a decrease in the amount of broad spectrum antibiotics that are used. So all of these things sort of help at a, at a population level where we're, we're decreasing the amount of antibiotics that are being used amongst the population uh, and, and the total use and the cost of those things, and we're not seeing an increase in harms to the individual in, in terms of things like increased mortality. So they're good things that go together even in the ICU. Um, so the question really is, um, how long is it before we really get clinicians in the ICU um, to, to take some of this to heart um, and, and trust that AMS can be a, a piece of their work? And, and I. Maybe that's the wrong phrasing because I think, particularly in Regina, I know we have a lot of clinicians in the ICU who are very um, interested and invested in doing this type of work. Um, so these are, this is just a great example of a little pilot project that can look at one specific area and, and get a better idea of are there places where we can make some improvements um, on some of the good work that's already happening. So um, the paper that was published is this, AMS in the ICU, Empiric Therapy and Adherence to Guidelines for Pneumonia. Um, so this was published in the BMJ Open Quality uh, Journal, um, and it was just published back in April. 
Um, it's open access, so anyone uh, can, you can just search that title and, and find it there. Um, I believe it was Shelby's first, first author paper, so kind of an achievement for her there, and, and we're quite happy to be um, a part of that. So there's Shelby for any of you who don't know her. So this was, uh, she was a summer student at the time. Um, this was when we were still RQHR, so she was part of the RQHR Regina Summer Student Program. Um, and she spent a good portion of the summer sitting at a table in our office reviewing charts and reviewing more charts and reviewing more charts and pulling out a ton of information um, that we used to put this paper together. So a lot of work on her part. Um, and then Jonathan and Casey were our, um, our, our clinical experts that helped sort through some of the information that she was looking at. So, um, I, a lot of people here are clinicians. I'm, I'm assuming a lot of the people online are as well. I'm not, so there's that brief overview of what we're talking about, pneumonia. Um, but the main piece here is that we're looking, uh, we were looking at the different types. So you have community-acquired pneumonia, hospital-acquired pneumonia, ventilator-associated, and aspiration pneumonia. So those are sort of the four categories that we broke things down into um, when Shelby was looking at comparisons about, uh, there's different guidelines for treatment of those different things. So. so the guidelines that we used came from uh, the Infectious Diseases Society of America. There's a few of the references there from the paper. Um, so some things to note at that point, the IDSA guidelines, uh, so the top one there, for uh, management of community-acquired pneumonia. Um, those are from 2007, so they were, you know, a decade old, even at the point that we were, were sort of doing this study. Um, and then the rest of them were a little bit newer there, 2016, um, for the, the second one there. So, but these were the guidelines we were using um, as a basis for whether or not empiric therapy was matching with the guidelines for treatment of pneumonia. So the way this worked, uh, it was a retrospective chart review. Um, so as I said, Shelby spent months sifting through patient charts. Um, we were including any patients that were at least 18 years old and had an ICD-10 code corresponding to pneumonia and an indication for pneumonia being recorded in their chart. Um, we uh, excluded anyone who was discharged or expired. Um, uh, sorry, no. We included anyone who was discharged or expired from one of the three ICUs in Regina, and the period that we pulled charts from was October 2016 through March of 2017, so it was about a six-month period there where we were pulling patients from. They were excluded if they were not in the ICU while they were being treated for pneumonia and for any subsequent ICU readmissions. So uh, the main piece here was to assess whether or not the the uh, antibiotic regimen that was uh, given to the patient was in concordance with the guideline recommendations. So Shelby would go through, assess the record to see if the antimicrobials were in alignment with the guideline. If they were, great success, we all celebrated. Um, if they weren't, then there was a bit more of a process. So uh, if the regimen wasn't guideline concordant, then that's where Jonathan and Casey, our clinical es experts, would step in and review some of the information with Shelby to determine if there was still a clinical appropriateness for the, uh, for the regimen. So they didn't match the guidelines, but if you considered perhaps the local antibiogram as a guide or other available patient factors that we may have had with the patient had allergies, um, if they had recent antimicrobial exposure, other comorbidities or co-infections at the same time, that's where Jonathan and Casey would sort of look at that and go, okay, it wasn't matching the guidelines, but because of this, this, and this, it either is still clinically appropriate, the, the antibiotic regimen that they chose, or uh, there is, I see no reason why these antibiotics would have been chosen, so wasn't guideline concordant and does not make any other sense clinically, um, at least based on the information that we had um, in the charts. So the big punch here was essentially this graph right here, so, or, or chart table, whatever. Um, so we've got 157 cases that were reviewed in total. And so you can see the breakdown there amongst uh, community-acquired, hospital-acquired, ventilator-associated, and aspiration pneumonia. The number of uh, charts that were included for each of those uh, different categories. And so in green are the number of cases uh, that were reviewed that aligned with the guidelines. So no problem at all in terms of uh, seeing a connection with they followed the guidelines based on the type of pneumonia. 
The yellow ones were those that didn't align with the guidelines but were still deemed to be clinically appropriate after a review. And then the red ones are those that didn't align with guidelines and were also not clinically appropriate. So the, one of the takeaways from this is that 75% um, of the charts that were reviewed either aligned with the guidelines or were clinically, still clinically appropriate if they didn't align with the guidelines. Which means that uh, the clinicians in our ICUs are actually doing a pretty good job of tailoring therapy. So not blindly following guidelines, so to speak, but when there is something different that needs to be considered, they are changing the antibiotics accordingly um, and, and having still a, an appropriate treatment for this patient. The other piece that I took from this, uh, when I look at it, is that there is still 25% of those patients. So one in four patients in general um, who have pneumonia in our ICUs in Regina here, um, we're not getting the right treatment. Respiratory staff to emergency. Respiratory staff to emergency. Um, so, yeah, 25% of the pneumonia patients that we reviewed did not have uh, treatment that either aligned with the guidelines and there was no other reason that we could find that would uh, deem it clinically appropriate. So it indicates that there might be some room for improvement um, in terms of the uh, treatment, uh, the empiric treatment of these patients. At least. Uh, so the other table that's in the paper there is uh, Shelly, as she was going through, had sort of collected the reasons why these were considered guideline non-compliant for the empiric therapy for these different types. Um, so obviously empiric regimen not aligning with the guidelines, not including atypical coverage, adding vancomycin unnecessarily, all these different things. So you can kind of see the breakdown there um, when we're talking about what the reasons for these things not being considered guideline concordant were. There are a few limitations to discuss about this study, um, some important pieces just for when you're thinking about this data and how it might apply to your setting. Um, number one, obviously it was a small retrospective observational study. So we don't necessarily have the power in the study to provide sort of a generalization to all patients and everywhere kind of thing. Um, but this is what we found with the ones that we reviewed. Uh, our data capture was suboptimal to determine if MRSA coverage in community acquired pneumonia was necessary. So we didn't actually, we weren't able to capture that piece. Um, another piece is that the IDSA guidelines for hospital acquired and ventilator associated pneumonia were actually both published, uh, had been recently published in 20, September of 2016. And since our study period, the patients we were looking at came from October 2016 through March 2017. Um, there is the possibility that for some of those uh, in those categories, which were not guideline concordant, it may be because they just hadn't caught up and reviewed the uh, newest recommendations yet and had not incorporated that um, and adjusted their practice. So that's one potential for some of those things. Um, and as with any sort of retrospective study, the, the uh, decisions we were making about appropriateness or not was all based on what was captured. So if, if it wasn't written down in the chart, we have no way of knowing if there were other factors that could uh, contribute to the clinical judgment uh, of the clinicians and their rationale for prescribing. So always a limitation with any kind of uh, retrospective study. So write it down, clinicians. Um, dissemination. So we wanted to get this information out to the ICU and, and to the people who were working there just to give them an idea of what we'd looked at. Um, so this was after Shelby had gone back to school. So Jonathan and Casey and I, I think it was October or November, had gone up to meet uh, after that summer, had gone up to meet with the uh, intensivists at one of their meetings. Um, and so we presented this information to them. And we got the usual looks from the intensivists, from any clinician uh, physician group that we talked to. So uh, a healthy amount of skepticism and wanting to know more and understand more about what went into the study. Um, the good thing is, again, having a, having a group that's involved and, and interested in uh, sort of quality improvement and this type of work um, is that this helped us spark a conversation. So we started a, a conversation amongst the group and it sparked some follow-up studies to sort of look at this and, and try and uh, pick out some more details that they were interested in. Um, and as Jonathan has told me, there is currently quality improvement process mapping underway to further optimize care um, for these groups of patients. Um, 
from the sort of stewardship and clinical appropriateness side of things, obviously these types of things we don't want to be one shots. We're always looking for a way to incorporate this type of stuff as a sort of ongoing audit and feedback so we can continually provide information to clinicians um, so that they can see changes over time in, in whatever it is, prescribing habits or, or test orders, whatever it might be. Um, the unfortunate piece with this is due to the labor intensive nature of, of data collection, um, this isn't something that we've been able to initiate a sort of automated audit and feedback program for. Um, we, for those types of things at this point, we need really electronic data that exists in some sort of database that we can pull and, and aggregate and uh, analyze easily. Um, and that just is not possible with a, with a, a physical chart audit. So unfortunately, we haven't been able to sort of get an, up, an audit and feedback program up and running for this particular um, case, but we are engaged with our intensive care groups in Regina here, um, or, or the units in Regina, to uh, develop some sort of a clinician report for them. So we're, uh, we've been working on that for a few months now um, to try and work towards getting something going where we can start to provide feedback about different things that they might uh, want to look at for improving uh, quality of care for patients. So that's kind of where that has uh, landed. Um, as I said, the paper is published now, so and it's, it's open access, so anyone can go and check that out. Um, it, I would encourage, you know, this is not something that is necessary, uh, necessarily stuck within the realm of the ICU. Anyone treating patients for pneumonia anywhere um, can ensure that they are familiar with the guidelines um, for empiric therapy and make sure that they're treating their patients um, appropriately. So uh, if you have any questions, of course, I'm happy to uh, answer what I can now. Um, you can type them in in the WebEx if you don't want to talk on the line. Um, you can also email us at antimicrobial.stewardship at sashealthauthority.ca. Um, and just a little plug there, you can check out our website. All of our contact information is there. Um, and a little tidbit about um, some of the study and links to the study are actually on that website as well. So I will stop talking and open it up to any questions. Perhaps if there's anyone in the WebEx world first, we'll start there before I take questions from the local audience. So the two follow-up studies, um, and then one last year was a retrospective review looking at administration of antimicrobials uh, through the eMERGE portal. Um, this year we've narrowed that down uh, a little bit further, working with uh, the intensivist group, uh, as, well as, as well as the pharmacy department and eMERGE. Um, to look at all patients that are arriving with sepsis to determine the time to delivery of care as well as the actual uh, direction of care coming through. And part of that is to do a process mapping of uh, delivery of antimicrobials in the eMERGE portal. I have a question, actually. Sure. Um, you had mentioned that this was a very labor-intensive um, study, given just the amount of charts that have to be analyzed and data pulled, is there any plan to make this process, I guess, more automated or streamlined or anything like that, or is it just going to stop with this study? So I think a lot of that would come down to the implementation of uh, physician order entry and having a much more um, connected electronic chart within the hospital. So having access to all of that information from one place uh, would allow us to essentially do what, sh uh, what um, Shelby did, but in an electronic format. And then we could have right, reports to be able to pull out the necessary information um, to at least allow for an electronic data pull. Um, I think the other difficult piece of this is the amount of brain power that goes into assessing the appropriateness of the antibiotics. So that's not necessarily something that we have the computing power in the region to, uh, or the, the authority here to do at this point, to my knowledge at least anyways. Um, so that would require some artificial intelligence to be able to connect pieces and make a call based on whether or not it's appropriate based on the many factors that, that feed into that. So the human touch is still needed for projects like this at this point, um, at least with our local resources, I think so. Okay, so the question is, um, were we able to determine if the length of stay or the outcomes uh, changed based on some of the factors we looked at in the study? Um, and the, the short answer is no, we, we actually didn't look at that stuff. So we weren't checking to see if there was changes in length of stay for the patients, depending on whether they were receiving appropriate treatment or not. 
Um, although it would be interesting to, to know, but uh, it was a relatively small study too, so. Yeah, yeah, as Jonathan says, we didn't have power, so we just didn't look at that, so. Well, the follow-up question there is, any comparison on outcomes between those that followed guidelines and those that didn't, and uh, same answer there. So yeah, we just didn't have the power to look at that. I mean, we had, if I go back here, way back there. So I mean, when we're comparing, you know, six ventilator, ventilator associated versus two, there's just not a lot you can draw from that small of a group if there was any differences in length of stay and, and outcomes and things like that. Maybe a bit more when we're looking at community, but even then it'd be a very small group, so just not enough power to, to make those decisions, so. Good questions, though. And thank you all again for tuning in. <laughs>